That video showed a pretty good introduction to what whirling failure is all about. And in our last class, we talked about the basic ways we were going to predict the whirling frequency of a shaft itself and a shaft with weights on it. So we said we would use Rayleigh's method to do this. Lord Rayleigh did a lot of things. So Rayleigh's method is the simple approach for determining the speed at which a shaft will essentially self-destruct. It goes through an elastic deflection runaway as it's rotating. So if this is the axis of rotation, let's say it's spinning around that at some frequency, we want to figure out the first fundamental frequency of failure, which causes this thing to undergo an elastic deflection runaway. That is that deflection just gets larger and larger and larger until it tears itself apart. And so Rayleigh's method for the simple smooth-sided shaft said that the first fundamental frequency of vibration was given by pi over L squared times the square root of E I over M. Now this is kind of important because L is the length of this shaft. D is going to be the shaft diameter. E is the elastic modulus of the shaft material. I is the uh, moment of inertia and is given by pi D to the fourth over 64 for a circular cross-section shaft of diameter D. And M, this is the one that can mess you up. M is the mass per unit length. Okay, so that's the way we would calculate the fundamental frequency of vibration, the first fundamental mode of vibration of a smooth-sided circular cross-section shaft of length L. Pretty straightforward thing to do. Now, the other thing that Rayleigh did is Rayleigh said, let's just imagine that the shaft is massless, and if we put some weights on the shaft, let's go ahead and put a weight here, call that one W1. Let's put another weight here, let's call that one W2. And let's put another weight here, let's call that one W3. We imagine that the shaft is simply supported it is again of some length L, and we have these weights at locations x1, x2, and x3 if our coordinate system is given by x and y in this direction. Okay, now, so if we know the elastic deformation of the shaft under the influence of these weights under static conditions. So we look at the static deformation, the static elastic deformation, which would be the, def the deflection at weight one, the deflection at weight two, and the deflection at weight three. Let's call these things Y1, Y2, and Y3. If we have those deflections, Rayleigh said that the fundamental frequency of vibration of the weights absent the mass of the shaft would be given by omega 1 is going to be equal to the square root of the acceleration of gravity times the sum over i of the weights at each location and their associated multiplied by their associated elastic deformation divided by the sum over i of the weights times the square of their elastic deformation. So this is a simple way of getting at an elastic deformation related frequency of vibration. First fundamental frequency of vibration of the weights on the shaft itself. So the next thing is we got an equation, a simple equation up here that defines the first fundamental frequency of vibration of the shaft. And we have an equation here that defines the first fundamental frequency brought about by weights that are located on the shaft at positions x1, x2, and x3. And this estimate is done using a simple elastic deformation of the shaft itself. So the next thing we do is we apply something called Dunkerley's equation, where we say that the combined frequency of vibration is equal to one over the shaft frequency of vibration squared plus one over the weight frequency of vibration squared. So this W here is actually W of the weight, and this one up here is W of the shaft. So this is a simple way of estimating the first fundamental frequency of vibration of a simply supported shaft using really straightforward approximations. The only challenge here is figuring out what the elastic deformations Y happen to be. So we got to figure out Y1, Y2, and Y3. And to do that, we're going to use a simple approach that we developed. Okay, what we're going to do is use a singularity function approach to determine the deflection equation for the shaft of diameter D with weights on. So we have the shaft, it has diameter D, we have weight W1 right here, weight W2 right here, and weight W3 over there. So we locate, locate these, X1, X2, and X3 from the end of the beam, which is a pretty straightforward thing to do, and then 
we have to figure out what the associated deflection is as this beam or this shaft deflects under the influence of those weights. So remember, what we need is the deflection at weight one, the deflection at weight two, and the deflection at weight three. Because it's that initial deflection which gives rise to the dynamic forces that are brought about by the rotation of the shaft as we undergo an r omega squared acceleration multiplied by the mass of these associated weights. And so we need to find the deflections, and we're going to use singularities to do that. If I call this side of the beam A and this side of the beam B, then you know, once again, we have this reaction at A, and I have a reaction over here at B that's supporting the shaft. And if I write the moment equation as a function of x, we did this before, you know that the moment is going to be equal to Ra times x. And now I'm going to use singularity functions. I'm going to have to I'm going to add to that w1 times x minus x1 using the singularity notation. I'm going to add to that w2 x minus x2 to the first. And I'm going to add to that w3 x minus x3 to the first power. So this singularity function notation is the easiest way to do things. And you're going to notice that this time I wrote these as positive. And I wrote them as positive because I now want to be consistent. I didn't make this clear to you last time, but I want to use an xy coordinate system like so. And if the weight is positive, it's pointing in the positive y direction. You know that reaction A is pointing in the positive y direction. And you know that w1, w2, and w3 are all going to end up being negative in these equations. But we'll do it just using the proper signs as given by the coordinate system so we don't screw things up. Okay, so what do we do now? We know that elastic modulus times i times the second derivative of the displacement with respect to position along the beam is going to be given by this moment equation. So now what we're going to do is just integrate this so that we get ei dy dx is equal to 1 half rax squared plus 1 half w1 x minus x1 squared. You'll notice that we just integrate this thing as a simple function of x. Uh, we don't integrate the parts inside there. All right, so we now add 1 half w2 x minus x2 squared plus 1 half w3 x minus x3 squared. All right, plus, uh, uh, we got an integration constant, C1. Okay, so this is the slope equation. Now what we need to do is integrate the slope equation to get the deflection equation. And you'll notice that every one of these loads has the factor 1 half in front of it. And that's because they are all just loads times a moment arm that I'm integrating from the moment equation. All right, so I know that in the next integral, I'm going to have a 1 6, and it's going to be it's going to be a factor in front of all of those, R A x cubed plus w1 x minus x1 cubed plus w2 x minus x2 cubed plus w3 x minus x3 cubed plus c1 x plus c2. And now we know that at x equal to zero, since it's simply supported, the deflection is equal to zero, which implies that C2 must be equal to zero, the first integration constant. Okay, now also at x equal to L, y is equal to zero. And from that, we can solve for C1. And if we do that, we find that C1 would just be equal to minus 1 over 6 times L, where L is the length of the beam, times the quantity, times the quantity R A L cubed plus W1 times the quantity L minus X1 cubed plus W2 times the quantity L minus X2 cubed. That should be a standard bracket there. Sorry about that. Plus W3 L minus X3 cubed. And there's my integration constant. Now that I have my integration constant, um, I can go back and sort out what the deflection is by plugging it back into the deflection equation. And I can very easily figure out what the deflection is. So we, we use C1 in the deflection equation. And all we need is, in order to use the Rayleigh equation, we simply need y1, y2, and y3. Using this constant C1 in the deflection equation, we can very easily plug everything into this deflection equation, taking note of the fact 
fact that C2 is now zero. We know what C1 is. We can figure out what the heck the deflection is when X is equal to the location of the first weight. Well, that's X1. So we can find from the deflection equation, we get Y1 at X1, and we get Y2 by plugging in the location X2, and we get Y3 by plugging in the location X3. That's what I'm going to do in my spreadsheet, and I'm going to show you that next. Here's a spreadsheet that I built to calculate the whirling frequencies using Rayleigh's equations and Dunkerley's that combines the smooth-sided shaft Rayleigh whirling frequency and the massless shaft with weights on. You will notice that I have a number of inputs on this spreadsheet, and those inputs appear as the length of the shaft, the diameter of the shaft, the elastic modulus of the shaft material, and the density of the shaft material. The units are the shaft length in centimeters, shaft diameter in centimeters, modulus in gigapascal shaft density and kilograms per meter cube. You got to make sure that when you use these things in the equations that your all of your units are consistent. You'll notice that I also have weights 1, 2, and 3 at positions 1, 2, and 3. And I enter the weight magnitude in newtons. It's a force. And I enter the location of those forces in centimeters. Then the green cells represent the calculated outputs. My deflections at each of those weights are in this cell right here. The units of those are in meters. The other important output is the frequencies. The shaft whirling frequency is the simple Rayleigh equation, absent the masses, the weights on the shaft. The Rayleigh with weights is assuming a massless shaft, and then I combine the two using Dunkerley's and report them in both radians per second and RPM.